Hi there, welcome to my channel, State of Mind Hypnosis. And uh, I have the lovely Lisa Jones here today with me. Um, she had a shared death experience. And uh, Lisa Jones began communicating with a collective energy known as the beings of love and light. Lisa shares this loving, calm energy with humanity to help them navigate the ever-changing challenges of living life on Earth which is very good these days. <laughs> Lisa Jones is the author of The Art of Living Happy After the Loss of a Loved One, inspirational speaker, intuitive guide, and consultant for top-level performers in global business, high-profile celebrities and individuals alike. Her life-changing meditations, podcasts, and stage shows reach and teach the powerful potential of spirit, abundance, and the key to true inner happiness. So thank you very much for joining me, Lisa. And thank you. Yeah, I look forward to this, uh, this interview with you. Thank you, Hillary. I am thrilled to be here. And it's it's an honor to share my time with you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, Lisa and I met through, um, I, I put out this uh, call for NDEers who wanted to do NDE recovery. And um, what that is, is just quickly, um, I take people that have had NDEs or STEs or shared death experiences back to their experience and uh, they get to relive it. I don't go through any negative experiences. I don't go through the death phase. We just go straight to source as Lisa can tell you. But um, did you wanna speak uh, just a moment on that? Absolutely. I'm, I'm so thrilled that we met through your hypnosis offering that you were you were um, putting out to the world and somehow I saw it on Facebook and, and um, yeah, so when we did our session together, you were able to take me right back to the place where I saw my husband transition to which was heaven, according to what I thought heaven was and um, and it was amazing. I was able to meet my mom who's passed since, um, since my shared death experience with my husband. And they each took me to their favorite rooms. I guess they have like their own room, which is like a holodeck or something like from Star Wars, which is cool. And they can make anything they wanted from their rooms. And they, um, so it was just, I mean, I'm kind of almost choking up, you know, thinking about it. It was so real and it felt like such a, such an opportunity to go back and and get to spend some time with them. So I, I just so cherished our time together and um, your hypnosis therapy is incredible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so yeah, that uh, I, I'll put a little blurb at the end of this video about anyone who wants to contact me or, or if they wanna go through it or have an interview or, or both. <laughs> so um, yeah, let's just dive right in Lisa. So I'd love to hear about your shared death experience. Yes. Well, it happened on February 22nd, 2004. And that was the night that my husband Ian passed away. He had been battling cancer for over seven years and um, he had had three stem cell transplants and multiple rounds of chemotherapy and radiation. And unfortunately, you know, there was just not enough medical intervention to cure the lymphoma that he had. It started out as, as just a lump in his neck and, um, and it turned out he ended up having both Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is very rare. I think they said maybe 50 people a year get diagnosed with both of those at the same time. So, um, so yeah, it was a really, really difficult seven years. Um, he did go into a remission for a short time during that, which was really wonderful. Our children were one and three when he was diagnosed and eight and 10 when he died. So it was a really um, kind of hectic life that we led with two young children and then him being ill and then our insurance company uh, wouldn't pay for us to have treatment in New York, which is where he had his first stem cell transplant. So they said we could either go to Houston or Seattle. And um, fortunately, his best friend lived in Seattle. So we, we went there, but we did live in a hotel for um, nearly um, I think it was eight or nine months while he was in the hospital and the children were there. And so um, Again, as difficult as that was, it was a really special bonding time for our family to be in that hotel room and, um, you know, really making the most of it. The school, they had a school for the children there through the hospital. And, um, and so it was kind of a unique time, time frame for us, but it was hard to not be near friends and family. So, 
Um, in November of 2003, one day the hospital just said, okay, you're going home tomorrow. And we're like, what, what's happening? And we didn't understand that they really wanted us off of their, um, they didn't want us to be there when he died so that he wasn't a statistic. And that's how hospitals keep their numbers, um, you know, up. And so we suddenly just were sent home and um, back to Connecticut. So then, so it was in November and then come February, we'd gone to the doctor on a Wednesday and the doctor said, you know, there's really nothing more to be done. It looks like we're in our final stages. And my husband did not want hospice to come. He felt like that was giving up and he didn't, you know, want to go there. And um, so we decided to, we weren't going to tell the children, we didn't want to ruin their, their week at school, which again, in retrospect, was not a good idea because by Friday he was incoherent and I had to tell them on my own, which was really difficult. Yeah. So, um, so I called the doctor Friday morning and, and they, he said, yeah, let's get hospice over there. And so Saturday hospice came and so did Ian's brother and his best friend flew in from Seattle to Connecticut. And that was wonderful because it was really the first time I wasn't home alone with him. And um, <clears throat> so that night I went and kissed my husband goodnight. He's, he was laying in our bedroom in the, in the master bed and my children had gone, my son to his grandmother, Ian's mom's house. And then my daughter was at her best friend's house because we, the hospice, when they came, they said, you know, he actually looks pretty good. It's probably going to be maybe three or four weeks before he dies. And I was like, oh my gosh, I can't deal with this because him being incoherent and, um, you know, just like I had never really experienced death at that point in my life. I was 37 yeah. and I still had three living grandparents and, um, and really just had not experienced it. So I didn't know what was going to happen next. And so his, I think it was his best friend or brother sat with him and I went to my daughter's room and I just, I prayed to the angels and to God. And um, I talk about how I got connected with the angels in my book and there's more to that, but just as far as the experience goes, I prayed and, and just said, you know, please help us. I know there's no way out of this. And so, you know, please just make it as easy and peaceful for Ian as possible. And to add to that, I was born very religiously and uh, was told that if you weren't baptized, you were gonna go to hell. And he was not baptized and didn't wanna be baptized. And I was really beside myself because I just was so afraid of what was going to happen to him. So I think that was another part of my, you know, reaching out and just hoping that everything would be okay. Well, after laying my head down and I mean, obviously I'd gone to sleep, but um, I know <laughs> that I left my body and um, was greeted by these two souls or angels. Again, it's hard to describe I don't really remember how they were dressed or anything like that, but I just knew that they were just these very loving entities and they kind of escorted me. And it was almost like we arrived in this beautiful rolling hills um, with fields and um, like the roads were made of gold. And um, again, we weren't in a vehicle per se, but we just kind of just kind of floated up to the this big building, which was castle-like. Um, again, it wasn't a castle, but it was. It reminded me of a castle. It was just a very, very large structure with kind of maybe sandstone walls that were super thick, but everything was super clean. That's what I remember. It was so spectacularly clean and bright and light and loving. There was just unconditional love everywhere. Um, and then I distinctly remember hearing that there was an announcement being made and it was the grand Mr. Ian Sharp is about to arrive and trumpets were going and there were these big banners and, um, and then they kind of led me into this building and over to a courtyard where all these souls were gathering. And again, I don't remember, you know, in my mind, it's almost like they were, I mean, blob is such a bad word, but like, they, I don't remember any distinct kind of characteristics around them, but I just knew they were these loving souls that were all gathering in the anticipation 
of Ian's arrival was completely palpable. You know, as the announcement was going, everyone was just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't wait, I can't wait. It's gonna be so exciting to see him. And and I was almost like maybe a fly on the wall or something. I was, I remember not being in the courtyard, but kind of observing and just listening and 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 feeling the the love and the anticipation of his, his arrival. And so just um, you know, as people like were gathering, all of a sudden the door just started to open. You could hear kind of this giant, you know, and everyone's like, oh my God, he's here, he's here, he's here. And right at that moment, there was a knock on the door, you know, knock, knock, knock. Lisa, Lisa, wake up, wake up. And right in that moment, I know Ian was like, his foot was coming through the door and I, I couldn't wait to see him. All of a sudden, I just felt like a trap door opened and I fell into my body and I, you know, was like, come in. And I just jumped out of bed and was, I, I had such a weird feeling because they'd said, you know, Ian just took his last breath, his brother. And yet I felt like I just saw where he was going and I was so excited. And I was like, almost, I mean, I was almost electrified with the palpable love and excitement of where he was going. And I couldn't say anything. I, I couldn't, I didn't say anything to his brother because I was, my mind was, I mean, I was kind of half asleep, kind of almost, you know, up there here, like I couldn't gather myself. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it was amazing. And, um, and then that night, um, or I mean, I went directly to my bedroom to go see him and his body was laying there, but obviously he wasn't there. I could tell his soul was gone. And I just, was overwhelmed with, with happiness. Like I was super sad for me and my children. That's what I was sad about. But overall, I just felt this exhilaration of uh, just super excited and, and so, so happy for him. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so do you recall any of the colors or, you know, like light or Tell me about that if you can, if you can. Speak. Great question. Well, as I say, and I, I had never read a near-death experience story before my experience. So, it, and it was even years later before I read, and I think it was, um, oh my gosh, it was that little girl, uh, Heaven is for Real, I think maybe, I forget exactly the title, but it's, um, it's about a young girl who falls out of a tree and then um, has a near-death experience and see, she sees Jesus and she was talking about the colors and and when I read that book I was just like I almost fell off the chair because I'm like oh my gosh this is what I saw this is so 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 exactly my experience of being there and um, the colors there are no words for them because I mean, it's just unlike any color. I feel like like here it's very, even though colors are very brilliant, I live in Maui and just looking outside my window here, I see beautiful fuchsias and oranges and mm -hmm. you know white clouds and the blue sky and the blue ocean. And yet they're muted compared to the, it's like living color on the other side for lack of a better word. And then there were colors that just, we don't have here. So it's it's difficult to articulate other than like what's coming to mind right now is just almost like sparkles. Like I love sparkles. Normally I have sparkles on my fingernails and toenails and on my makeup, <laughs> but that's kind of what it is. It's like, like I said, like living color and they're just all like super iridescent, you know, yeah. living color. And um, were the, the, the souls, the spirits, the energy persons that were there, did you get a sense of what they kind of looked like if they had shape or form or if they were just light or what? Yeah, I feel like I didn't recognize anyone. Again, I didn't have any people that had died prior to yeah. this. So maybe, I mean, I'm just now thinking about that or putting that together that I'm like, yeah, I didn't really recognize. I knew, I mean, Ian's father had died just right after we had gotten married. And so um, like, I didn't recognize him or um, or like I had a grandfather die when I was very young, but I didn't, you know, recognize a particular soul, yeah. but I could just tell that these, again, when I say blobs, it was like, um, they were energy, uh, energy sources or, you know, energetic souls that were, it was almost a spark of light, but yet there was, there was some sort of 
uh, body structure to them. But I, again, it's, it's, there's like no articulating articulate words to describe them because they're <laughs> not in the human language eh? <laughs> right not in the human language right but I could just tell that there was such an excitement of yeah. of Ian returning home and um you know the giddiness and the 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 excitement and the happiness and the this beautiful homecoming I mean that's now I mean I've lost my fear of death because yeah. I just, it's almost like, oh my gosh, I can't wait, especially right now with all these crazy times are going through, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And um, t talk about that love feeling that you felt, because I know, I know from a little experience that I've had, um, I, I, I kind of get where you're, you're at, um, but just explain that for people, if you can talk, speak to that. Yeah, that that's a great <laughs> Great question, because yeah, there was this sense of overwhelming, unconditional love, like I've never experienced on this planet. Mm -hmm. And um, not only was it for me, but I mean, everybody there, and especially for Ian, as he was coming back, excuse me, um, as he was coming back home. But um, I mean, it just felt like, uh, you know, I was, I was, greeted by the two angels and just there was I mean I I felt like now that I've talked to a lot of people with NDEs and um it's you know I hear about people going through the tunnel and then you know they come and then they might go into a building or you know they're heading in but then they come back before I almost feel like I came in the back door right so I was actually in the building I was like backstage watching him come in and so I got to feel that unconditional love that is palpable, that's available, and that is available to everybody all the time, but we're, we've separated ourselves from it here. I mean, we've all agreed to forget yeah. what it's like over there so we can have these experiences um, on earth, but it was so nourishing and, um, you know, really... I mean, like I said, when I jumped up and I, I had just been told my husband died and I was overflowing with this feeling of just happiness and joy and, you know, exuberance and yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, you were right there, right? <laughs> I was right there. I was right there. And then, uh, so then later I had to go collect my children, right? And tell them, which uh, was again, here I am stuck with having to go tell them that um, not only, you know, because when he was incoherent and I told the children, actually he did, he had a, a moment of lucidity where the kids ran in and jumped on the bed and he hugged them and, and was able to talk to them and tell them how much he loved them. And, you know, he'd watch over them, which he has ever since it's been 17 years and he's still he's just amazing but um so I was getting ready it was about six o'clock in the morning he had died about two or three a.m and so I was blow drying my hair and as you know in my mind I'm just thinking about okay what do I need to say and how is this going to happen all of a sudden Ian's voice was right in my left ear and I was just like he well he just said oh my god Lisa I love you so much and I'm like what you know and then he's like but it's so awesome here. <laughs> yeah. And so that to me was total confirmation that, you know, not only did I get to visit or visualize and see it, uh, but that he actually did go there, you know, and then he's been talking to me ever since. So that was, that was the beginning of my mediumship skills. <laughs> That's beautiful. And so do you hear through the same, uh, I, I know when I teach people how to hear spirit, hear source, um, I, I often say to, to listen to one side or the other side and just almost differentiate the sides. Does that make sense? So right. one yeah. side is your ego and then one side ends up being the spirit. So you always know when, when it's spirit. Right, right, right. Great idea. Or does that happen? Oh yeah. It definitely, for me, um, especially Ian, um, and I'm just trying to think now with other spirit, because for me, it's kind of a knowing more than a hearing per se, that first time that was so clearly a hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, now I think it more just drops in kind of to, I think I have almost a vacant space inside that, you know, people know or entities know that they can drop in information <laughs> yeah. there. Um, because it's, I don't really get words per se. Like, again, I did initially because I, I hadn't done it before I was, you know, and Ian was able to 
be right there. Um, but now as I've worked on my mediumship skills and things like that, I think it's a little more, I can tell, I can differentiate whether it's human or past human versus angelic or even, uh, you know, uh, masters and, and then the beings of love and light, that's kind of a collective energy that is, um, you know, has been with me for a long time. I, I always beg them. I'm like, tell me your name. Give me, you know, like Abraham or, yeah. you know, these other ones. And they're like, well, first of all, for the longest time, like maybe two or three years, they wouldn't give me any name. They're like, you, you humans are so attached to words and to names. And we're not going to give you that. You just need to trust us. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So then they finally said, okay, you can call us the beings of love and light. And then I've just recently started calling them the Bilal, yeah. uh, just to shorten it a little bit. So yeah, it's, it's almost like a we, right? It's a yes, it's a we for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I'd love to know your after effects, you know, um, lots of people that have NDEs and STs and uh, SDEs, <laughs> you know, yeah, they, share uh, death they experiences. have these, uh, these after effects. Um, so, I mean, I know you're, you're speaking about your mediumship um and maybe you can speak a little more about that or other things that that has happened well yeah for sure i had a huge variety of things happen to me and again it wasn't until okay so that was in 2004 i moved to maui in 2017 and then i was introduced to the ians group which is the international association of near death studies here on maui they had opened a chapter so i was asked to be their second speaker and, um, and then I was asked to be the co-leader, which was amazing. And that just opened a whole new world for me because uh, I ran the, the groups for experiencers. And so I got to hear everybody's story. And when, when people would talk, it would start to unlock doors for me that I was like, wait a minute, now I understand why I, I basically went vegan after my experience. Like I could not, eat, I used to eat McDonald's and drink <laughs> sodas and uh, you know, eat just whatever, lots of cheese and dairy and all that. And oh my goodness, after my experience, I feel like my whole DNA changed. I could not consume these things. I literally had an entire body. I had yeast in my entire body for like two solid years. And I didn't understand what was happening. I mean, I was breaking out on my arms, on my shins. No. And, um, and I finally went to an acupuncturist. I went to, a a, you know, alternative doctor, because I was very much, I mean, when my husband was sick, we went to the doctor, went to the oncologist, we didn't do any kind of alternative healing. I was, like I said, very religious, very like the doctor knows best, follow directions and, um, you know, had no idea about the connection between mind, body, spirit and, and eating what you eat, you know, is affects your body. I mean, how ridiculous that I, <laughs> I was 37 years old and didn't kind of put all that together. And, um, but yeah, so I could no longer, so she put me on a diet to get me off dairy, which was a huge thing. I had acne my whole life and I had no idea that it was the dairy because I never liked dairy as a child. My mom used to force me to drink my milk and I, and I just was like, oh no. And so after I got dairy out of my, my life, my skin cleared up. I'm like, who would have thought that that was something, you know, that happened. Um, so yeah, so, uh, food was a big thing. Now I'm not so, um, I'm definitely still dairy free. I'm not necessarily, uh, you know, vegan. I occasionally, I just allow my body to really tell me what it needs. Primarily plant-based is what I eat. And that makes me feel super good. I love yeah. plant-based. Um, but occasionally, you know, I do have fish or sometimes I do need a little bit more protein, just depending on what's going on. Um, but let's see, I'm trying to think there was something else that recently popped up that I was like, oh my gosh, I think that was from my experience. Um, well, definitely just super attuned to sound and light. I mean, I um, I just recently got a new e-bike, which I absolutely love, but it has an alarm system on it. I didn't know. And when I went to turn on the battery, the alarm went off like right in my ear and I was in pain for almost 24 hours the sensitivity of my hearing is extraordinary now. And um, so I just have to be really careful and I, I can get super, you know, too much activity around me. I just need to go and <laughs> yeah. hide. 
think of yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, do you have, uh, I know a lot of ND years uh, experience electrical, like things. Oh yeah. Malfunctioning. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, in fact, um, when I really got serious about doing my work, I was working at a hedge fund and my guides kept telling me, you've got to quit, you've got to quit. And, and I didn't really understand why other than, you know, go do your work. And I thought, oh gosh. And um, I mean, yes, I want to do my work, but this is such a great paying job. And, you know, I, I get great benefits here, but uh, part of it was my husband, he was 44 when he died. And just before he died, he did say to me, like, I really regret being a tax attorney and just pushing numbers around on pieces of paper uh, for so many years. I wished I had helped more people. Mm -hmm. And it broke my heart when he said that because he was such a generous, kind, loving man that, you know, I never would have thought that he didn't feel fulfilled, you know, in the work that he'd done on this planet. But um, as I approached my 44th birthday, that's when my guide started saying like, time to go do your work. And, and it didn't hit me until just before I turned 44. And I'm like, oh my God, all I'm doing is moving numbers around on pieces of paper because I was a CPA and I was doing taxes for this hedge fund. And uh, so I finally quit. And actually when I gave my notice, they gave me, they said, if you stay for just two more weeks, we'll give you $10,000. And I'm like, okay. So that seeded my business, which was fabulous. Nice. And then about six months later, my company got indicted by the FBI or I don't even know who it was, but um, they, they weren't following all the rules. And uh, so three of my principals ended up going to jail and Thankfully, I wasn't there and had nothing to do with it. But if I had been there, they were all interviewed and, you know, interrogated by the government, which would have been not fun. So my guys were kind of like, yeah, we couldn't tell you what was going on, but we wanted you out of there. I was like, okay, <laughs> it's good to listen to them. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so. Uh, you stopped working for the hedge fund. Yep. Stopped working for the hedge fund. And I started, it was Art of Living Happy initially was the name of my business. And it, and it ended up being the name of my book. Mm -hmm. And I really just, um, I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. I wanted to do the mediumship. And um, so I joined the Chamber of Commerce. It was so funny. And then I had a little booth with some angels and I didn't even know what I was doing. I just kind of just kept fumbling my way. But then the Playhouse director uh, it's a little, it's a 500 seat theater in Ridgefield, Connecticut. She said, well, Gabrielle Bernstein is coming. Would you like to sponsor her? And I had no idea who Gabrielle was or even what that meant, but I just said, okay. And so Gabrielle has written three or four New York Times bestselling books. And she's a real um, amazing marketing person and, you know, spiritual guide. Uh, I've never been able to figure out the marketing side of things, but <laughs> I, I sat in the in the lobby and just did these little three card readings for people and people were just astonished at what I told them in, in a matter of like 30 seconds to two minutes. And so then the Playhouse director said, hey, do you want your own stage show? And I'm like, okay. And so um, the following year I, I was able to go and 150 people showed up and then the following year 500 people showed up and it just was amazing. And then I got to be, I, I was the Monday morning medium on star 99.9 and um, did a lot of, uh, when my book came out, a lot of TV little promo things, which was super fun. And then out of nowhere, Brooklyn, from Brooklyn, a business or a company, a uh, television company wanted to do a TV show about me and the angels and all that. So um, it was super exciting. And like I said, I, I hardly did anything other than just keep showing up. Uh, unfortunately, that's when my mom died, though. That was 2013. Um, no, sorry, 2014, she died. And uh, I, that's when I just, I had to step back and um, just find myself. It was, four, it was 10 years exactly after my husband died. She had really been my rock and my supporter. And so when she died, I just was like, how can I help others when I can't even, you know, get over this grief? So uh, interestingly, I'm going to share something. This is the first time I'm sharing about this. I did a silent retreat the last couple of days. And, um, and so one of my guides came through and told me that I had an NDE when I was an infant and I'm still like, what is happening? And that's actually partly why I took my mom's death so hard is because I was given up for adoption as an infant and 
my birth mom, although she wanted to keep me back in 1966, it was not acceptable, especially as a minister's daughter, which she was to keep the baby. So she was sent away to a mother's home and, and she had me and um, got to hold me. Again, I don't know for how long, but I know I was, um, it was 13 days before I was taken by my, my adoptive parents. And um, apparently, at least this is what the angels told me yesterday, that um, while I was in the care of the home, I was so sad. I was so desperately longing for my mom, you know, my birth mom, because suddenly I was just taken from her and separated, right? And left basically alone. I mean, without a loving mother caregiver. And so I so desperately wanted out of this life. And then somebody, one of the caregivers apparently dropped me or somehow I, you know, had a conk on the head and I popped out of my body. And so I got to go and be in this beautiful, amazing experience of the, you know, the afterlife. And again, I don't remember much. I'm going to, I just learned this information. So I'm going to start spending some more time learning about this. Um, and so when I agreed to come back, because they said I had, especially this time right here, right now, to be helping people on, you know, this planet Earth through this difficult time frame, um, I, I came back and then I was greeted, you know, my mother, my mom, Judy and Brian, who adopted me, but I was so disappointed that it wasn't my real mom that came to get me. And so because of that, when my mom died, Judy, who I loved, and she was such a wonderful mom, and it, it compounded my grief because it reactivated my loss of my birth mom, of not having her with me. And it makes, I mean, when I found this out yesterday, it just, it put another puzzle piece back together for me Absolutely. because I couldn't understand why my mom's death was so devastating to me. But if you can imagine as a baby to not, you know, to suddenly lose your mom, you know, and then a stranger comes and takes you away and you do the best you can, but I never got to fully grieve that loss of my birth mom. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That makes so much sense. Um, yeah, it really does. Um, maybe we should have another one and go back. <laughs> oh, oh, I didn't even think about that. We should do another one and go back. <laughs> oh my gosh. Isn't it interesting? You're the first person I've told about this. So maybe that's why we're talking <laughs> about this right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so um, I've, you know, read a lot about you and I've seen your uh, other interviews and stuff. And I, I wanted to touch upon the whole manifestation because I, I really, I really, really believe in it. And um, I've actually um, taken a lot of people through life between lives, you know, um, and they end up in the um, Akashic Records or library or, you know, you know mm -hmm. And um, there's a book there and usually, I can't even tell you the amount of times it's on a pedestal and it's open or closed and the person can go up and the pages, this is just a quick interjection, <laughs> but um, the pages are like cottony, they're not quite paper, they're, they're beautiful cotton. And um, I'll tell you, uh, a lot of people got to pages that were empty and I was thinking in the, in, um, the uh, hypnosis, in the life between lives, I just thought, okay, well, you know, it hasn't been written yet, right? Well, one person that I brought through was told by their higher self to start writing and to write what they want in their life. And I just mm -hmm. thought, oh my gosh, this is like manifestation on steroids. Right? Absolutely. My whole body just got a total tingle, yeah. which is truth. <laughs> I'm like tingling all over here. I know. Um, so now I take all my hip, almost all of my hypnosis clients through it. Um, even if they're not going in between lives, you know, like between lives, but anyway, so I wanted to ask you about manifestation because I just love it so much. And, you know, I use it for myself, I use it with my clients, and uh, I'd love to get your take on it and how it's affected you in your life or others. Or... I love it. I love it. Wow. Well, I've not heard of that technique, but I think that's a beautiful technique. And of course, that's, um, 
you know, that's what we're all able to do is to really focus on what is it we want, but to then to really go into the subconscious mind, right? And then actually write it and yeah. and make it make it so. Um, well, one of the things that um, and this is what happened after my dad died, uh, my or my my adopted dad Brian, because um, he was all about uh, collecting money and just being like, and he wasn't super. I mean he was a millionaire, but not like uber millionaire, you know, like he was a, he was a professor. And so he really collected money and just kind of was almost like a hoarder of it. And I remember, you know, like him showing me his bank statements or his, his, his thing. And look at me, look at me, I'm a millionaire. And I'm just like, okay. And then later he told me his accountant said, you really need to spend your money because you're just, you know, you're going to have I mean, just start spending money rather than just because he would go on these vacations and be very miserly about his money and yet he had plenty of it. So um, he went in to have elective surgery and he ended up getting an infection and his entire body circulation shut down and he was a heavy smoker. And so it made sense, right? That that all happened. However, he came to me about two weeks after he died. He woke me up in the middle of the night and he said, go start typing. So I start typing. And he's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I, I now understand what was happening. He's like, I created in my physical body what I was doing in my external body, which was collecting and not, not circulating his money. And he, so he just became this hoarder of money and just being like, oh, look at me, you know? But meanwhile, <laughs> he was doing that to his physical body and that's what we do in life, right? What we do on the outside ends up happening to us on the inside. Wow. And, and so part of this whole idea of manifestation is to realize that thoughts do become things and it kind of is from the inside out, right? So you need to start with thinking about, or, you know, really using your heart, like, what do I want most in life? Um, and, and then, you know, create the thoughts of that and, and write them down because writing is, you know, starts to crystallize them. It starts getting them out of your head and onto paper and then to focus on that as to what you want. And, um, and I'm telling you, like that hedge fund job that I got, I put together a whole feng shui. I'm all about feng shui. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, but to me, that feng shui is really more about intention and focus. It doesn't, to me, I know some sects get into, you know, the north, northeast and the south, south all that. Like, no, it just to me, it's the easy bagua and put things because it, it makes you think about what you're wanting to create. And so I did this whole feng shui garden in the front of my home with a, with a um, little flowing river and everything. And I had tried to get a hedge fund job earlier and sent out resumes. I didn't hear anything. And so I let it go. Well, a year later, the day after I wrote the check for my garden, I get a phone call out of the blue from some hedge fund um, he uh, head hunter and said, oh my gosh, I don't even know where I got your resume, but I just wanted to call and tell you that there's a hedge fund job just um, in your town, part-time, you know, excellent benefits and pay and all this stuff. And I didn't say any of that on my resume, but it just, that's what I really wanted. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, that's incredible. <laughs> I know it's so incredible. So I just, I don't know. I, to me, it's about what you focus on. And so many people are focusing on the wrong thing. They're focused on what's not working in their life, what they don't want, what they, you know, all the, all the drama, all the stuff. So it's about letting go of that and really coming into your heart and focus on what you do want and love and, you know, forgiving others, forgiving yourself, it's, it's, it's how to live your best life truly is, um, you know, coming from that angle. And, and again, I don't watch the news. I don't watch media. I, I choose what I put into my body, whether it's what I feed it or what I watch or what I listen to. And that, you know, again, all those are building blocks for what you're creating in your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and now you're, you're going into something else too, an IAM's sharing career? That yes. Well, I've been doing that now almost, um, it's been for sure over two years, maybe three. Uh, so the first Thursday of each month, I do the IAM's online share group for near-death experiencers or, or uh, spiritual experiences. Basically, anybody who is supportive and interested and open 
is welcome. And they just started doing them for free, which I'm thrilled about. And ever since we've done that, um, we've been selling out. It's not even selling, but you know, people sign up and we have 30 slots. Yeah. And it's just such a beautiful place for people to come. And a lot of times people share their near-death experiences for the first time because they've always felt uncomfortable sharing about it in public because there's still to this day people that will call them you know crazy or that they don't know what they're talking about or you know that it's blasphemous or you know whatever but these sharing groups and they have them throughout the month so if if the thursday one doesn't work it's 9 p.m eastern time um, they also have them throughout the month and then i'm going to start offering them i just started i just launched my new website called lovefromlisajones.com and it's part of me channeling the beings of love and light. And um, there's two uh, right now, just two, but hopefully adding more meditations or actually just uh, one's called love and one is called light. And it's the, from the beings of love and light and um, with beautiful piano music that was specifically uh, written by a dear friend and so, yeah, so those are there. And then I'm gonna start offering. So I do the first two, first Thursday with IAMS and then the, the third Thursday is going to be on my site. So I'll open another, nice. you know, opportunity for people to share. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And all that information will be below this video. Um, uh, information to contact uh, either Lisa or myself about anything that you've heard uh, during this interview. <laughs> Great. And, um, yeah, so I just want to thank you so much, Lisa, for interviewing with me. And thank you. Uh, yeah, it was just wonderful talking to you. And uh, I hope that we we talk again. And I hope Sounds I can make good. it to an IANS conference. <laughs> 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 well, yeah, let's hope they have a live one again. I think this year it still may be virtual. I don't know. I'm not sure what's happening. But those I've been to two, two live ones. And they were just amazing. To be around so many like-minded people is just nurturing. Um, it's it's just one step away from, I guess, being in heaven. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll talk later.